Well, hello everyone. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. I am Steve Vargo with Prima I Group, and as you can see us here at the top, uh, I'm very excited to host this webinar with Dr. Jeff Ward. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background on Dr. Ward. He has been practicing optometry for over 15 years, uh, most of it in Highlands Ranch. Is that correct? Yes, Highlands Ranch, 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 suburb just south of Denver. Uh, Jeff's a graduate of the University of Houston College of Optometry, and he's completed a residency in cornea and contact lens at the New England College of Optometry. Uh, aside from routine optometry, Dr. Ward spends a substantial part of his day fitting specialty contacts like sclerals, keratoconus, post-surgical, post-transplant patients. And in 2006, he began specializing in orthokeratology. And Jeff went on to earn the distinction of Fellows of International Academy of Orthokeratology in 2006. And he also served as fellowship reviewer for uh, that organization as well. So uh, Prima is very excited for tonight's program, the nuts and bolts of building a top-notch orthokeratology practice uh, with Dr. Jeff Ward. And the program will run about 30 to 40 minutes. He informed us that it may go a little bit longer than that. Um, uh, and we'll follow that up with a question and answer section at the end. And we're recording this program as we do um, all of our webinars actually to be placed in the member resources section on the Prima website. So Jeff, thank you um, for doing this tonight. And we, we thank everyone for their participation. And I'm gonna hand it over to you, Jeff. Excellent, thank you. Well, I wanted to start by uh, thanking Prima for giving me the opportunity to share uh, what I know about building a successful orthokeratology practice. Um, and and uh, as Steve said, um, it's it's almost been a decade now, and so I've I've learned a lot in that ten years, and I just want to share some of the the gems about what works and what doesn't work to to generate referrals, um, uh, so that people don't have to make the same mistakes that I made. So we'll start with just a little background. You might be wondering, you know, I know Steve did a nice little introduction, but I just want to let you know a little bit more about me. Um, I did, uh, like I say, start doing orthokeratology in 2006. I bought my practice in 2003 in uh, the same uh, town that I uh, my new practice is in. It was only 1,400 square feet. You can see uh, some pictures over here. Um, and, and like many people, I started with a, a very well-known uh, company uh, in the orthokeratology world. Um, you know, but now that I've learned a lot more, um, you know, it was kind of a more generic design. Um, and, you know, the reasons I got into it, I wanted to lessen my reliance on vision insurance plans. Uh, people older and wiser than me uh, told me that, uh, you know, the, the, the vision insurance uh, outlook, uh, reimbursements uh, weren't uh, going up like maybe our cost of living was. And so, um, you know, and I and I was in a very competitive uh, environment when I opened, or I, I bought a practice after it had been open three years, and it was honestly kind of struggling at that time. Um, there were two other optometry practices in the same shopping center, so I really wanted to do something to distinguish myself, <clears throat> excuse me, from my competition. And then the other thing that kind of led me into it was I, I enjoyed working with children. Um, as you'll learn as we go on, they're, they're some of the best candidates for orthokeratology. Um, I won't go over some of this stuff. Steve mentioned how I, you know, uh, went on to, to um, um, uh, learn, become a fellow of the orthokeratology academy, and I'm going to mostly talk about that at the end. I want to make you guys aware of that organization because if you're interested in doing orthokeratology, uh, they are phenomenal. Um, I've done hundreds of cases. Honestly, I, I uh, unlike some of my friends who you know keep track down to the decimal point, you know I, I kind of stop keeping track after a couple hundred. But I've done hundreds of cases. I wouldn't say it's thousands, um, but enough uh, that you know I've, I've experienced the full gamut from easy cases to difficult. Um, and what's nice about orthokeratology is 
you know, it's 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 allowed me to drop undesirable vision insurance plans. So you know, when some of these plans just start uh, reimbursing at ridiculous levels, yeah, let's just get rid of them, you know, and we can move forward because you know, as you'll discover, I mean, you do you do one orthokeratology case and you've probably made enough money for the day, and if you do two, I mean, you're doing really well. Um, so it's just nice. Uh, you can work smarter rather than harder. And so it's also enabled me to, to really um, um, improve my practice. You can see some pictures here. This is my new location. It's um, almost two and a half times the size of my old location, and, and, and patients are loving it. Well, well you know, before we uh, get into much more, you know, let's say you uh, haven't even done OrthoK. You're just on this webinar because you're thinking about doing OrthoK. Yeah, is, is it the right fit for you? Well, you know, um, not everybody, I'll be honest with you, um, do you enjoy fitting RGPs? I wouldn't say, you know, you have to have a ton of experience fitting RGPs. Uh, you know, just enjoy it. You know, if, if, if uh, uh, and that's kind of what I mean by are you a sprinter or a marathoner? You know, are you, are you more of a problem solver? Do you enjoy a challenge? Uh, you know, if, 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 if you're going to have to kind of troubleshoot and it's going to be a lengthier process, well, you know, you, you know, even though some of these lenses, which we're going to talk about, have really made it very easy in many cases, um, there are going to be cases where, you know, you are going to have to do some problem solving. And if you just kind of are a plug and play type person, yeah, maybe ortho K isn't going to be, you know, your cup of tea. Um, finally, you know, uh, I think the most exciting group, and I'm going to get into that to, to do ortho K on, is children. And um, so, you know, if you like working with children, it's a no-brainer because uh, you're, you're going to really be able to uh, get a lot of uh, children to do this uh, for the reasons we'll get into. Well, and, and you know, before I uh, uh, discuss, uh, you know, the business aspects of orthokeratology in detail, you know, I always, whenever someone's thinking about getting into ortho -K, I try to set the expectations. It's, it's you know... Um, it'd be neat if we hung the orthokeratology shingle on our door and the next day, you know, 50 people came in and signed up. And it just, you know, in most cases, uh, most people I talk to that, that, that do this as a specialty, it just doesn't happen that way. Um, you're going to have to, um, you know, put in some hard work to, to, to get the uh, orthokeratology uh, specialty going uh, strongly. And I... I, I mentioned this book, High Hopes. Gary Barnett was the guy who turned the Northwestern's football program around. Um, if, if those of you are familiar, they were kind of the, the laughing stock of the Big Ten, and he took them to the Rose Bowl. And one of the things he talks about in his book is, you know, uh, how you just start pumping the water, and at first you'll, or you pump, you know, the water pump, at first you'll just get a trickle, and, and then it starts to flow, and, and then it starts to gush. And, and that's kind of like how I like to think of my orthokeratology specialty, how it's grown, you know. You, you know uh, and it, but it's kind of good because, you, you know, if you're new to orthokeratology, you know, if you have a case that you have to troubleshoot, you don't want to have a, a, a bunch of tough cases all at once. It's kind of good that it slowly increases so that you can increase your knowledge over time. So orthokeratology, you know, I don't know. It's not universally embraced. Certainly ophthalmology may not have the most positive opinion about it, but I've even found when I've talked to other optometrists that um, it's it's not always so widely accepted. But let's let's just kind of look at why you might want to consider doing orthokeratology. Well, you know, Prima is a, a, a group all about, you know, uh, uh, working smarter, not harder, and increasing profits. And, you know, I will, as I've alluded to already, it, it, orthokeratology can be very profitable if you charge the appropriate amount. Um, what's really neat about orthokeratology is um, your patients are going to be loyal. You know, they, they don't go buy their orthokeratology lenses from 1-800-whatever. Um, they are <clears throat> extremely loyal to you. They know that it's a very specialty lens, and they don't even ask if they can get it from 1-800-whatever. Um, you're going to... You're going to draw patients from outside the normal radius. Um, I, I'm in the Denver area. Uh, let's see, I've got uh, patients that come to me from the mountains. Uh, I've got a patient in Nebraska. Um, you know, uh, specialty contact lens-wise, but that's another story. 
but it's the same kind of idea. I've got patients even in Mexico. So long and short is you really have the potential to draw patients um, that you wouldn't normally uh, see walk through your door. It's professionally gratifying. You know, um, don't get me wrong. It's 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 fun to make people see better with an Acuvue Oasis, but um, the the wow effect and and the the, the you know, when the parents, all of a sudden the child can see 2020 without glasses and contacts, um, it's pretty cool. It, it's pretty, pretty motivating and, and, and very gratifying uh, to do that for your patients. Uh, it's much more of a wow factor than glasses or conventional contacts. And, and as I mentioned, you know, you can distinguish yourself. I, I, I wish I could remember, I called uh, some sources to see if I could find out the exact statistics, but you know, it's a very small percentage of optometrists that actively do ortho K. I want to say it's in the one to three thousand uh, range, uh, from what I remember. Um, and and so you really are um, setting yourself apart from the thirty-four or thirty-five thousand other optometrists in the nation. And what's really cool about ortho K, we don't have to worry about somebody else coming in and stealing our thunder. It's you know, we're not treating red eyes that could go to you know the emergency room or could go to their ophthalmologist you know oh, we are it we, we oh, only optometrists do ortho K it's our baby and so you don't have to worry about somebody still in our profession or our specialty from us or invading it well there's lots of people that can do ortho keratology uh, you, you, you've got a, a big potential pool for candidates I'm going to talk about the ones that I think are better and, and ones are worse, but obviously uh, patients not wanting to do LASIK uh, would be candidates, patients who maybe found out they weren't candidates for surgery, but I would put caution to, you know, make sure you screen for ectasias because you don't want to do ortho K, at least in the conventional sense, um, on someone with keratoconus. You know, anybody with an active lifestyle, uh, it would be, especially if they're involved in water sports where you know, contact lenses aren't ideal, uh, but the group that I am really excited about, and I, what, why I think orthokeratology is maybe the most exciting thing, it's like this big hidden secret in optometry. The patients where this is just fabulous for is myopic progression, and we're gonna we're gonna get into that. Uh, patients with low to moderate myopia, we all know from basic lectures, are good candidates for orthok, but I, I will tell you that when you get more and more into this world of orthokeratology, patients with even high myopia, hyperopia, and presbyopia can potentially benefit. Well, you know, the, the myopic uh, progressors, <laughs> the, the people who are getting worse and worse every year, the children, um, this is the group I really want to focus on. And, and why? Well, I'm going to tell you that the way you are going to get conversions, people that are going to say yes, to doing orthokeratology uh, in your practice is by educating your pa your parents about the problem of myopia in, in our society uh, and, and just to go over some statistics and then to present options to them that will keep their children from potentially becoming very nearsighted. Uh, myopia in some parts of Asia 80 percent of girls are myopic. In the United States um, there's been a 66% increase in myopia over the last 32 years, um, and that statistic is from 2004. So that's now almost a decade old. So I'll bet you it's more than 42% of people overall that are nearsighted. And I, I have a picture here of a girl on a computer because all my patients seem to think it's it's due to all this up close work. Um, but let's let's look at that. You know, myopia is it? You know. <laughs> What's the story on myopia? So we know that reason people become more myopic is because the axial length of the eye increases. Their eye grows. It's unwanted and uncontrolled eyeball growth. Uh, myopic patients, you know, uh, there is a genetic component. You know, myopic parents tend to, to have more myopic children. So, you know, no, no, no question there's a, a genetic component. But it's interesting to note that recent research shows kids in urban populations are more likely to become myopic than in rural. And um, very interesting, kids who spend more time outdoors, even if they have myopic parents, and even if they do lots of up-close reading and, and, and computer use, 
are less likely to become myopic. So there's, I think that's fascinating. There's something about natural sunlight that seems to be keeping kids from progressing as bad. So I always tell my parents, get your kids outdoors. Get them off those stupid computer games and, you know, have them, have them play outdoors like we used to growing up. But, you know, it's just so widely held, uh, you know, that myopia is because of reading and up-close work. But it's kind of interesting when you, when you, when a study was done that looked at native Eskimo populations and what they found is that, you know, um, they, they, the population naturally uh, worked for, for centuries in, in small enclosed structures. They, they create these little tools that they're always working at very close distances. And, and, and those Eskimos don't tend to become uh, myopic. However, when you send their kids to schools, all of a sudden they become myopic. So, it, you know, the, the point of this slide isn't to necessarily say that, you know, near work doesn't contribute to it, but it's maybe not as simple as we think. And I, I, that's the main thing I wanted to get across is um, it's, 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 a, it's a story that we don't know, have all the answers to yet, why people are becoming so nearsighted at epidemic rates. Well, who cares? about all that. You know, we can always just up the prescription. And the reason I'm going through this is probably you already know most of these things, but if you don't, this is powerful stuff to educate your parents on. I'm I'm you know probably one of the reasons I have a pretty good conversion rate on getting patients to sign up is I you know the bad news about orthokeratology is a lot of your patients have never heard of it. The good news about that is there's a huge market. It's untapped but the bad news is you're going to have to educate them. And so that's kind of the hard work part of, that's the water pump, you know, getting this uh, uh, thing going. Well, um, you know, why, 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 you know, who cares? Let's just give them stronger contacts. We'll give them stronger glasses. Well, the more nearsighted you become, we all know that it causes uh, retinal detachments to become more likely. Of course, we're more at risk for glaucoma um, and cataracts. But I also mentioned to the parents, you know, hey, you know, if your child becomes a minus nine, he may want to have LASIK down the road, but he's not going to be able to if his cornea is not thick enough. And so if we can keep him at a lower prescription, he's going to also have more options down the road. So we're going to, we're going to, I really stress to the parents that, you know, we're going to keep your options for your child. Uh, uh, they're going to have more options when they get older. And on top of that, we're going to decrease their chances of having some of these other eye health issues. Um, and it's just nice to be less dependent on your correction. So I'm, everything has led up to uh, this slide, which is, um, I think, the most exciting thing in, in optometry right now, and that is myopia control. Um, there are, um, uh, you know, believe it or not, several uh, avenues that we can go down to significantly slow down the progression of nearsightedness, it turns out, if you haven't kept up with the research. Um, atropine, it turns out, you know, in high percentages, 1%, uh, 0.5, I've even seen studies that show 90% uh, slowing of the progression. But obviously, at, at those concentrations, um, you, you know, you run the risk of the patient um, having, you know, problems with light and, and, and near focusing ability. But it turns out lower concentrations, even as low as 0.01%, um, while not as effective, maybe you're only going to get 50% slowing, 40% slowing of the progression. Um, while they're not as effective, it still slows down the progression uh, significantly. So that's, that is actually becoming a more um, widely accepted um, um, treatment modality for slowing down progression. A lot of people believe that, you know, um, RGPs uh, slow down the, the, the progression of nearsightedness, and it turns out, um, that really even, you know, well, we all know soft doesn't, but uh, it turns out even the, the, the newest studies on RGP show, it really doesn't, clinically, it's pretty insignificant the amount that it slows down myopic progression. There's a whole camp of people that believe that undercorrecting, you know, if your patient's a minus three, prescribed minus two is, is going to slow down uh, the progression of myopia. And it turns out uh, the latest research shows you're actually going to increase the rate of myopic progression if you do that to your patients. So undercorrecting is one of the worst things you can do. And but uh, I've highlighted in red the next um, method that's good for myopia control, 
and that is soft multifocal contacts. It turns out with the, uh, the research that's been done and with the distance center design um, that you can get a 30% reduction in myopic progression. Um, and and the, the reason for that we believe, and you're, well, I'm going to get into it here in a second, uh, the reason for uh, the soft multifocals uh, slowing down the progression is optically it's doing something similar to orthokeratology, uh, but we'll get into that here in a second. And then bifocals, progressives, you know, pretty much clinically insignificant when it comes to slowing down progression. However, if your patient does have an esophoria with a large leg of accommodation, there's some evidence to suggest it might slow down um, the myopia, the progression. But orthokeratology um, is the gold standard. And research shows uh, with generic designs, uh, that we can get a 50% reduction in myopic progression. And the, the chart here to the right, um, research done at Ohio State University, um, there, there's two major studies, the Crown study and the Lorig study. In both studies, uh, you can see the red line is the patients that um, did not wear any orthokeratology, and you can see that their eyeballs grew significantly. And then if you look at the gray lines, uh, the, the, uh, in both studies, there was significant uh, uh, slowing of the progression of nearsightedness, uh, and it corresponded to about 50%. Now, I am going to tell you, and it's not just me, uh, those of us that do lots of orthokeratology, we see way better than this. I, I, you know, I will tell you that... Um, those of us that do orthokeratology on a regular basis, I'm surprised if a patient gets worse. And I'm not, that's no stretch of the truth. Um, I'll have patients do it for six, seven years and then stop, wash out, and in most cases they're no worse, or if they are, it's maybe a quarter of a doctor. I've even had some patients get better. Obviously, I'm not shrinking the eye, so I'm guessing accommodative things were playing into getting a higher prescription at the initial visit. but. The long and short is those of us that use custom designs, and that's why I don't really know if these studies really show the true potential for orthokeratology since they were using more generic designs. Um, those of us that use custom, I mean, it's, I hardly see my patients get worse. So, and the beautiful thing about orthokeratology is it's fabulous. There's no side effects like atropine. Um, it, they're footloose and fancy free, the, uh, the adults and the kids are. They can swim and no contacts fall out. Well, let's talk a little bit, and I'm going to avoid too much theory because this is a business lecture, but let, I, again, I sometimes you get those engineer parents, you'll be surprised how much they want to know about this and what it takes for them knowledge-wise uh, to understand before they'll pull the trigger. But most conventional glasses um, and contacts, um, they will correct the vision. And I don't know if you guys can see my mouse, but they'll correct the vision, and you can see in this diagram, perfectly at the macula. Uh, so that's hence the reason that the patient sees 20-20. But what you can see is the, the, the peripheral uh, light rays, uh, most glasses and contact lenses focus that light behind the retina. Okay, so um, that turns out to be very important. Why? Well, you would think it would be central retina that drives axial uh, length, but the think of it more in terms of um, um, the uh, uh, democracy. You know, the eyeball grows according to the biggest population of photoreceptors, not according to the smallest concentration of photoreceptors. So if light, if more photoreceptors are experiencing light focusing behind the retina, um, which is the case with most conventional glasses and contact, contact lenses, the eyeball is naturally going to grow to meet where that light is focusing. The unfortunate thing is um, then the peripheral light becomes more in focus, but now the macula is out of focus again. So why, what's the magic of orthokeratology? Well, as you can see in my diagram, you know, at the top, we take a uh, pretreated cornea um, and we flatten it centrally, but we create that nice perif mid peripheral ring of steepening. 
And what you can see on this diagram, that those little bumps, the little mid-peripheral steepening there, now focuses the light either on the retina, like the macula, or even in front of it. We say, in many cases with orthokeratology, we create myopic defocus in the peripheral retina. So we're actually um, creating um, um, myopia in the periphery, totally shuts off the desire for the eyeball to grow, because if it were to grow longer now, it's going to get more out of focus. Uh, too bad the eye can't shrink, <laughs> then we'd really have a neat thing. Um, so that is what's kind of driving uh, eyeball growth. And, 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 the, and the theory is that we create that myopic defocus uh, in the periphery, and that's why uh, Ortho-K turns off that drive for the eyeball to grow. Richard Anderson, uh, I'm going to mention his website here in a minute. Um, he is um, uh, one of the uh, big players in the Orthokeratology Academy and uh, has been doing Ortho-K for a long, long time. And just this is just a nice quote that, you know, we just, we've got to get out of our habits of thinking of, um, you know, people are going to come back and we just keep giving them thicker and thicker glasses till they have Coke bottles, you know. We don't, maybe we don't know all the answers, but it's time we start uh, thinking about treating myopia as something that we can prevent from getting worse. So let's talk about um, some of the, the newer uh, orthokeratology lens systems, the, the ones that I think, I'm kind of cherry picking what I think are the best ones for you here, so that again, you don't have to do all the legwork. There's pros and cons to each, and I'm going to just go over them briefly. Again, not all orthokeratology lens systems are created equal. I got away from the generic design I was using because, quite honestly, it was weird. I would have success. It would be the easiest thing I ever did one minute, and then I would take on another case. Minus two should be easy, and it wouldn't work. When I switched to a more custom design, my success rate went through the roof. It, was, it made orthokeratology fun rather than something that, you know, God, why does anybody do that, you know? Uh, so the first one I want to talk about is Gov, and I'm, you know, Gov is 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 a, a really uh, a wonderful orthokeratology system, um, and it basically involves. There, there's two ways you can go about fitting it. Real simple. You can enter your data into their little calculator, and and um, their software, and it, you even tell them what the HVI, the horizontal visible iris diameter is, and you just give them some measurements, and then it custom creates a orthokeratology lens for your patient, and they send it to you, and then you troubleshoot if there's a problem with the fit. Or you can even fit from a uh, inventory of lenses, uh, so you can do trial lens fitting as well. And I mentioned GP specialists, they are the distributor here in the US uh, if you want to look into them. What's neat about Gov is uh, in this in the picture you can see Arthur Tung is the is the genius behind the design and uh, Carl Loss is standing behind him. He is, if not the best, one of the best orthokeratologists in the world. Um, I'll mention some of the stuff that he does. It's just insane. Um, but Arthur Tung has developed a orthokeratology lens where you can. Um, uh, re even even eliminate up to 10 diopters of nearsightedness. He has a hyperopic design that works very well. A lot of you uh, may not know, but uh, hyperopia with orthokeratology is a really booming area in orthokeratology because it's a way to make your um, um, presbyopes, um, especially your emetropic presbyopes, you can make them artificially nearsighted um, in one eye, uh, simulating monovision. Uh, they don't. They, you know, they, they love it. Uh, there are even multifocal designs that Arthur has. Post LASIK, it's the, the, the design is made so that you can dip into the crater uh, uh, and flatten more if they've had progression. And then I mentioned earlier, I, I don't do orthokeratology on keratoconus. I don't recommend it. Um, but Carl, Dr. Loss, um, he will literally, with this keratoconic design, he will literally take an inferior cone move it to the center of the cornea, then fit them in a standard orthokeratology lens by flattening the central epithelium, 
and um, uh, achieve almost normal vision. Uh, and so just, I, again, I don't go there, uh, but it's crazy uh, some of the stuff that you can do if you become uh, very proficient at orthokeratology. OrthoTool is another neat system. Um, it's uh, uh, a software where you simply enter the patient's uh, K reading, spectacle refraction. But what's neat about it is it simulates the tear layer. I've got a diagram of that. And um, you can kind of get a sense of how the lens will fit relative. The only drawback to this system, and, and this is Eddie Chow, he is the inventor of OrthoTool. Um, um, you know, the drawback to the system is that it just takes central K's and spectacle RX and then you kind of look at the lens on the eye and then you can go in and you, you'll see he's got these design tuners that you can use to customize the fit um, if you're if the standard design doesn't work so it's there's a lot of assumptions made with this software about the shape of the patient's cornea because you're not truly um, designing off the topography and this this is just an example of what um, the profile looks like um, and, and then like I say you've got a lot of you can see all those parameters that you can get in there and adjust uh, but these don't get me wrong these lenses work very well I, I I don't fit this particular design myself but I've sat on the review board uh, for um, doctors that use this design and um, it works very well uh, with these little customizations that you can do uh, you can really get good results Wave is the third. I'm only going to go over four. So, um, but Wave is the one that I do the most with. Um, I got a, uh, I switched to Wave uh, about 2008, and I've never looked back. Uh, um, that doesn't necessarily mean it's right for you, um, but um, it would definitely be one I'm look. I would look at if you're thinking about doing orthokeratology. It's truly custom. You take the topography, which um, I'm shown there. Uh, most of us use the Caratron, which is the topographer on the top, uh, you, you, and we most of us use the handheld. Don't get the slit lamp one uh, for a variety of reasons that we don't have time to get into. Get the handheld if you go with Wave, trust me. Um, take, there is a learning curve, but once you get it down, it's, it's a wonderful topographer. Um, but you literally take the topography, you import it into the Wave software, and then you custom design the lens 360 degrees around, it takes into account the individual variations in patients' corneas. Hence the reason, you know, like I say, the problem with generic designs, in my opinion, is that they work great when you have a standard cornea. The problem you run into is not all corneas are standard. Some have steeper peripheries than others. Some have flatter peripheries. Some have asymmetrical attributes to them and so it's very you run into problems when uh, you know the standard design doesn't work well this takes into account all you know for lack of a better term the weird properties of your patients corneas and then you design based on that um, the um, I just again I'm not going to go into too much detail here and uh, anybody I, I'm going to give you my email at the end so happy to go into more detail but what's so cool you, I show you a little screen here uh, a wave screen where this is where you go into the software and, and, and design you have um, various little parameters balls that you can adjust their positions and this allows you to change for instance base curve you can get in here and change uh, center thickness edge thickness um, and there are different modes of complexity you know you can start out with a very simple mode where you basically create the same design 360 degrees around, that would be like a generic design. But you can get even into GSIM, where you can design it differently in the 180, from the 90, from the 45, from the 135. So, And you can even get into freeform, where you can design the lens completely different in each of the separate meridians on the superior corner, cornea uh, versus the inferior. So it's incredible how custom you can get with this system um, and because it's so custom you can do higher prescriptions uh, I've heard of minus 14 being done with this I, again 
don't go there if you're new to uh, orthokeratology, but um, but you can achieve much, much uh, better results with a custom uh, system. Again, hyperopia, is, this works very well with WAVE. Um, you can do post-LASIK patients. You can even do presbyopic designs. Um, Ken Maller, who is the Yoda of WAVE, uh, if you ever decide to take this system on, I, I went down and spent a considerable amount of time with him. Um, um, but he even does, he'll mold uh, a small little button ad in the middle of a myopic ortho K. Um, so it'll create basically a center near zone with ortho K. He, he, among many other amazing things that he can do. You can do scleral ortho K lenses with WAVE. Um, wonderful when you just get a patient. It doesn't happen very often with WAVE, but every once in a while I get a patient where you just can't get the lens to center. I'll do one of these scleral designs. By the way, that's off-label FDA, so you need to make sure your parent, patient's aware of that. And you can finally get wonderful centration after, you know, you never would have gotten it maybe with a corneal design. You can even increase or decrease the size of the treatment zone depending upon how much uh, glare or halos your patient's getting. And, um, and then, of course, what's cool about the wave system is you can do your regular hard lenses, your regular bifocal hard lenses, and scleral, even regular sclerals with WAVE. So um, this is just a little more information about WAVE if you're interested. Uh, this is kind of their uh, contact information. They have a program where you can actually pay for the topographer um, if you fit their lenses, and it's a promotion they run every so often. And so I won't get into too many details about that other than to say my topographer cost me nothing because I basically they comped it in the form of free contacts. So um, just wanted to make you aware of that. This is the final system that if I was thinking about getting into orthokeratology, you know, this didn't exist when I got into WAVE, but I think this is a really neat new system. And at the orthokeratology meeting this year, this was the one that had the hot buzz. It's called iSpace and Forge is their orthokeratology design, but it's it's very similar to WAVE in that you actually import a true topography and then custom design from that topography. The difference being one of the complaints about WAVE is that there's a steep learning curve. I will say that that's not near as bad because they now have a lot of uh, wonderful training tools. But um, um, what's so appealing about this system is it's supposed to be very user-friendly but still extremely powerful because it's very custom. Um, it, uh, here you can see how they, uh, um, their uh, profile looks uh, when you pull up their um, software design um, software. Um, I mean, so contact lens design software. They even have a lens design wizard. So again, it's, it's, it's designed to be kind of like Apple, I think, where everything's very plug and play. Um, you can even do toric designs. So that if, uh, again, we were talking about uh, patients where maybe there's a very big difference in the meridians of steepness. And, and so and you can, they even have a high myopic design. Uh, in addition, like WAVE, you can do sclerals or regular RGPs as well with this system. So it's not just ortho -K. Well, let's move on now to informed consent uh, and the agreement. You know, it's, it's um, I really... Uh, think this is one of the most important things that you can do, uh, not only to protect yourself legally, but when I finally wrote up a really good informed consent and agreement, um, uh, it was wonderful to give to the parent. It explained what it was. Again, many times you're the first person telling the patient who this is or what this treatment is, but it also allowed me to really explain the, the policies and procedures of my office and gave the patients peace of mind of what they were signing up for and it really increased my uh, conversion rate. So I you know, don't think of this just as a stupid little um, clerical task. Um, if you put the right things, which I'm going to explain here in a minute, in your informed consent agreement, um, it'll, it'll help you uh, get conversions. Um, so what do you want to put in there? Obviously, you want to describe what ortho-K is. And by the way, I am happy to email anybody my, my informed consent agreement if, if you want it. Uh, what You want to explain what ortho-K is. Obviously, it's an informed consent, so you want the risks and possible side effects. Um, 
you also want to put in there, especially for higher prescriptions, if you're going to take those on, that you may still have a need for a daytime correction. That way they can't come back at you and say, well, you never told me I was going to need glasses after this. And you want to talk about how it's completely reversible. I can't tell you, it's crazy, how many times uh, before I had this uh, document, I would explain to the patient, now this is the good news about orthokeratology, Mr. Jones, is it's reversible. The bad news is it's reversible. You're going to have to keep wearing them every night like a retainer, and yet I'd get a week or two into the treatment and the patient would go, now when am I going to have to stop wearing my ortho K lenses? And it just, you know, but I have not had that happen since I created this. Um, and then you want to mention that it does slow down or halt the progression of nearsightedness, but the key thing is don't guarantee it. Uh, you're looking for trouble. Uh, say that it may uh, slow down or even halt the progression. I think that's a good way to word it. Good idea to put the FDA limits in there. If you didn't know, right now it's only FDA approved up to minus six diopters of myopia and a buck seventy-five of sill. Um, all that hyperopia, uh, multifocal, keratoconus, any of that stuff, uh, higher myopia, you need to make sure that the, they're aware it's an FDA off-label use and, and address that. Either have a separate form um, informed consent about that for those patients or, or just somehow included in your uh, informed consent. In the agreement, you know, like I say, this has just been wonderful because it just states very clear um, what our system is. You know, so in other words, you want to specify in detail what your initial year of orthokeratology fees are. Um, and, you know, um, I have different tiers. Uh, I wouldn't have one fee for orthokeratology. Um, easier cases are, are I'm going to charge my lowest fee and more difficult obviously the higher fees. Um, I charge a global fee. I'm going to be honest with you, um, you know, to each his own. I, I know other doctors that prefer to do a, a as you go fee like the more visits the more expensive it's going to be. I just like for my patients to, you know, I make an assessment. There are, yes, are there times where the case ends up being harder than I thought? Absolutely. Are there times where the case ends up being easier than I thought? Absolutely. And honestly, for the most part, they balance each other out. I view it kind of like insurance, you know. Um, it, it, it all, it ends up being profitable, you know, for the most part, even though you end up having some where you guess wrong. Um, you want to address whether or not you recommend a backup pair or you include a backup pair in your uh, first year fitting and then whether or not you're going to, we do project cleanings in the office. And just as a clinical pearl, um, I always recommend, um, I always, I emphasize very much that the patients come in. You can get progen off the internet and the patient can do it at home I, for just a bunch of reasons. And again, I, I can see I'm already at 45 after, so I don't want to get into all too much detail. I just think it's better to have the patients come in for their cleanings. Well, key points to include about the uh, agreement as well are your annual orthokeratology fees. So now they've been through a year of the treatment. I mean, before I had this agreement, I would have patients come back and think that maybe they had paid that first year fee and that it covered them for their life. You know, um, I, I never said it. I know that, but that's what they heard. So now we include now after the first year, um, these, this is what your fees are typically going to be. Um, and um, that's nice because then there's no surprises when they come back and they have to pay that extra orthokeratology fee. Um, I include the progent cleanings as part of my fees. I just, I want to encourage my patients to come in and get their lenses super clean. I call it super cleaning. I don't use the word progent. Um, patients can relate to that and it keeps them, you know, in communication with us and keeps them from screwing up and using it wrong and permanently damaging their eye. Um, but also, most of the problems you're going to run into with orthokeratology, it really works great, but when it doesn't, it's because the patient hasn't cleaned their lens as well. Um, so that's another reason I like to include it. Refitting fees. Okay, you know, want that in the agreement. There are times where you know, maybe for some crazy, crazy reason you started with this design and it just didn't work out to the patient's satisfaction. Um, now they come back and you're going to have to refit them. 
um, you know, trust me, um, you could really end up paying the patient to do orthokeratology if, if, if you don't charge a refitting fee. And, and they understand, you know, that this is a, um, a treatment and there's no guarantee it's going to work. Um, and so, you know, you just have to, if you want to run a, you know, pause, uh, you know, be in the uh, uh, black, uh, you need to, to charge a refitting fee. So I always let them know what those refitting fees, and I have tiers for those too, based upon the complexity of the refit. Um, final things that you want to put in there, you know, your refund policy, which I'm going to get into here next, your break each policy, loss policy, um, you know, um, recommended replacement schedule. That's huge. Um, really stated in there because it's an RGP. You know, these. I have had a rare patient disappear for five years and then finally come back. Yeah, my ortho K is not working very well. You know, well, no wonder. But um, I rec me personally, I recommend replacing the lenses every two years. I have colleagues that recommend it every year. But just have it in there. It's great. It sets the expectation. Patients don't bat an eye, and it's it's good. It's just it's good. It's not forcing them to get lenses they don't need. It's it's good health. Uh, for them to replace their lenses on a regular basis. Um, and, and then the other stuff is pretty self-explanatory. Refund policy. You know, I, some people might think I'm crazy for doing this. I, I don't know. I, I think this is a great idea. And I can count, I've been doing this for almost a decade, and literally I can count on one hand the number of times I've had to do a refund. Um, but What's nice about the refund policy and being in my agreement is it really gives the patients peace of mind that, you know, because here's the thing, when you're doing a treatment that a lot of times patients haven't heard of, you know, it's not like LASIK where everybody's heard of it, um, they're skeptical. And this gives them an out so that, you know, even though they like you, they trust you, they've been coming to you for a long time, this for many of them this is uncharted territory. And so, this is how I do my refund policy, that the longer we're into it, the less I refund, and I eventually get to only uh, store credits. Another interesting thing I'm mentioning is you're going to do this on a lot of uh, teenagers um, who have their driver's permits, and when they got tested, they, they needed the restriction for vision, so you just want to have a form, and I'll be happy to email what I give my patients that says, okay, this restriction no longer applies because they're doing orthokeratology. Otherwise, they'll get pulled over and they won't have any contacts in and they could possibly get cited for it. Well, this is uh, uh, probably one of the slides of, of most interest to everybody. Um, what should you charge? And Nick Despotius, who I'm going to talk about here in a minute, um, he does the supercharger practice lecture, and he came up with this. and. And what you can see, I won't go through it word by word, but you can basically see that when it's all said and done, if you charge $1,600 for an orthokeratology patient, you're probably in most cases going to break even. And so I can't tell you what to charge, but that gives you an idea of, you know, you don't want to be charging $1,000 unless you like making donations to your patients. Um, payment options, you know, honestly, um, all I'm going to say about this, because I'm sure you're all aware of care credit, allows them to spread out the payments. Don't structure payments in your office. Either use care credit so that you get your money up front, or you can do what I call a 50-50. Take 50% down when they order lenses, and then 50% when they pick them up. But I will tell you, it's weird, um, but I had uh, several patients where I created like a six-month payment plan just with the office, then they stopped paying me after two months, and I never got the money. They just disappeared off the planet. So uh, I, I wouldn't. It is a more pricey thing, but if, you know, if they need to save up the money, they need to save up the money. Don't. It's better to wait for them to save up the money than to do structured payments. In my experience, vision insurance. Well, first of all, do we really want vision insurance involved in this? You know, um, personally, I think we need to keep them to a minimum. Uh, because we'll be lucky to get $400 for ortho K if, if vision insurance decides. Um, but you, you don't have to take a discount on ortho K. Uh, it's considered a specialty fit. 
so you don't have to take a hit. Um, we do let patients use their contact lens allowance uh, so that they do get a discount uh, based upon that. Um, but just keep in mind, you know, you know, um, this is an elective. It's like LASIK or cosmetic surgery. They don't have to do this, so don't feel like you know you need to give them a huge discount because they have insurance. Consultations, you know, um, <laughs> do you charge or not charge? Um, you know, I think there's arguments for both. Um, I will just tell you that I don't. I um, I have patients come in, and um, I'm happy to talk to them about it. And there are times where they leave and I never see them again, but um, uh, many, many times. If they're serious enough about OrthoK to come in for a consultation, your chance of getting them to sign up is very good. And, th and that's the last thing I'll say. Um, if you're, you know, not excited about OrthoK yourself, um, you're going to have a hard time getting a lot of conversions. And so... Um, um, enthusiasm is a good thing, <laughs> and uh, I would just, you know, if you're not 100% behind ortho -K, I wouldn't do it because it'll come out in your conversation with the patient. Finally, um, who to avoid? Um, you know, I, I think a lot of being profitable is knowing who to do this on and who not to do this on, and, um, you know, I, especially if you're new, I know I talked about some of these exciting designs that you can do minus 10 and all that, but I would say stick with, you know, the FDA guidelines, maybe even um, um, stick with uh, um, the lower end of the guidelines at first just to build your confidence. Um, dry eye, I would rather do a minus 7 with great tears than a minus 2 with dry eye, believe it or not. Molding is not good with dry eye patients. Keratoconus, um, there are, I was telling you about Carl Loss and how he'll move cones. It's pretty fascinating. Um, but, I, I, you know, first of all, you're pushing on the cone. Um, you could induce more scarring, and then that could be a legal nightmare. I just bring that up. Asymmetrical corneas, especially if you're using a generic design, stay away from that. Engineers, they're really picky. And um, there's, you know, the, this ortho K is, is not for your anal retentives. Um, sorry to put it that way, but um, you just want people that kind of go with the flow um, for the most part. Sometimes I'm surprised. Um, and then big pupils. A lot of people don't think to consider pupil size. But just like LASIK, you're creating that, that mid-peripheral steepening. It can cause terrible glare and halos at night. And so especially in adults. Now, kids, it's crazy. They can have big pupils and not even complain a bit about glaring halos. But adults, it's something to be especially wary of. So I know we're coming to kind of the end here. So I'm going to be very um, succinct. Um, and Steve, chime in if, if, uh, if I need to uh, bring it to a halt. But uh, as far as external marketing goes, I'm just going to tell you, in many cases, I might as well flush to, uh, money down the toilet. Um, I, you know, if you go on TV and radio, go on a format where you can discuss it uh, for maybe five to seven minutes to educate the public. Uh, I've had the phones ring off the hooks, and I've gotten good leads when I go on shows like that. But little short radio verse or TV verse, you're wasting your money. The Asian population, this is probably worth mentioning, um, uh, Chinese, uh, um, Indian, um, they, they are very well informed about orthokeratology, much much more so than, than the um, rest of the American population, and uh, very open to this treatment. Um, and um, probably 50% of my cases, and maybe only 10% of my city is 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 uh, uh, um, Chinese or Indian, but probably they're 50 percent of my ortho K patients. So Chinese publication schools would be money well spent. Um, but the best marketing you can do is internal. Trust me, this is where you want to. This is you're going to have to pump the water pump uh, to get things flowing, and and but this is where your efforts are going to pay off. 
Um, there's some really cool things here. You know, create an orthokeratology packet. You know, one much like the LASIK surgeons have with, you know, doctor bios, uh, brochures. Uh, this brochure that I've got here to the right is from the American Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopia Control, and um, you can order them. And uh, so you don't even have to start from scratch. Even put testimonials. You know, ask ask some of your best ortho K patients to write up how much they love it. Um, ask, are you interested in orthokeratology on your history form? Um, you'd be amazed how, how that will uh, give you the opening that you need to talk about it. Put on your business cards. List yourself as an orthokeratologist in addition to being an optometrist. You'd be amazed how many people, when I hand my card, say, "Well, what in the world is that?" You know, and then. Five minutes later, you know, I, I want to get my kid in that. Um, have your staff wear buttons that says "Ask me about Ortho K." Uh, that is 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 a really good one. And then there's a whole bunch of materials that you can get from the AA, um, OMC uh, videos, uh, contact lens, place cards. Uh, but this up here, this is Nick Despotitis's book, and I know his name keeps coming up, but he's just phenomenal when it comes to um, uh, marketing orthokeratology in your practice. He wrote a book that's very easy for parents to read. I always give this to my engineer parents um, who really want to research it because it really um, presents all the options for kids who are nearsighted, orthokeratology being one of them. And then, you know, internal marketing also has to do with your equipment and office decor. I'm sure you've read that. I mean, it's you just if you have a sloppy practice, you know, old decor and old equipment, um, you're just not going to get the conversion rate like if you have a really nice new office. Do you discount? You know, you know, maybe when you're new, you know, I, I always viewed in the beginning, I didn't mind doing a discount because I kind of viewed it like uh, tuition. Like even if I might lose some money on the case, at least I could get a good 10 or 20 solid cases under my belt, get my confidence up. But down the road, I don't think you want a discount. We, we're already taking enough hits on uh, discounts for second pairs with insurance company. Yeah, I, personally, I, I wouldn't discount. Families, yeah, I'll do a 10% family discount just because, you know, both if they're going to sign up the brother and the sister, yeah, sure. You know, if, if that's what it's going to take to get them to, to sign up both kids, I'm fine with that. Uh, but as a general rule, I think it's a bad idea. And then another really cool marketing idea is, um, or, or, or honestly, not only marketing, but a way to keep your patients happy. In the first 30 days, it's so important when they sign up and they pay these high dollars for this fancy treatment that, that you stay in touch with them. And I, you know, do emails, you could do phone calls, but the main thing is just to let them know what to expect. Um, and then, um, you know, uh, tell them how well they're doing, uh, the fact that the lenses awareness is normal when the eyes are open for them not to be real comfy. Um, you'd just be amazed how it just makes it go so much more smoothly and how you're much less likely to have dropouts when you're just there to kind of hold their hand. And most importantly, thank them. I always at the end of an uh, email or the phone call I'll say, you know, I just really want to thank you for putting your trust in our clinic uh, for uh, to let us treat your, your children or your vision. And, you know, we sometimes forget to do that. And we're really hitting a home stretch here. Um, refitting someone else's case. I put this in here because from a business model, it, it, you know, those of us that have been doing this, we get these patients that come from some other practice where the doctor tried to fit them and um, they come to us because they heard that, you know, you do a lot of orthokeratology and sometimes you just feel bad for them because they already paid a lot of money to be fit from scratch and now they're going to come and have to be refit with you. You know, I'll be honest, you know, there's sometimes there's a reason these patients are in your chair because they weren't easy and it wasn't that the last doctor was bad. And so I just caution doctors, yeah, you might not want to do the sympathy discount because I mean, you might want to give them a little bit of of a discount, but don't go crazy because there's a good chance that these are going to be tough patients. All right, we are really hitting the home stretch. The I wanted to give you guys the information about the American Academy of Orthokeratology and myopia control. 
Dr. Kerry Herzberg is amazing, um, one of the nicest people you'll ever meet, and he's the founder of this organization, and they do a meeting, Vision by Design, and if you're wanting to get into Ortho K, this is the meeting to go to. They have an Ortho K boot camp that's designed for people that don't have any experience, and then, of course, they have courses in CE where you can learn the latest, and they even, they even focus on specialty lenses like sclerals. They even have a scleral workshop and a whole exhibit hall. That's why I know all these different designs because you get to play around. Myopiaprevention.org is a fabulous resource not only for you but for parents like that want to do more research. Uh, 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 Richard Anderson, the guy that I showed you earlier, he's the one that created that website. And then uh, Supercharge Your Practice. This is Nick's information. I've mentioned him a bunch of times. I'm not, I'm not kidding you. It is he gives this lecture at Vision by Design every year. It's a four-hour lecture in the evening. It is phenomenal. Uh, it, you know, passion with capital P. It's fun, but you know, a lot of these, a lot of these great ideas that I've mentioned tonight uh, came from Nick's lecture. So I'm um, standing on big shoulders, but he's one of them. And then finally, I just wanted to put this quote in here because I think. You know, maybe some of you are already doing Ortho K a lot, and you just kind of wanted to see how somebody else goes about marketing it. But for those of you who are kind of on the on the high board and you're thinking about uh, taking the leap, you know, um, you know, uh, sure it's normal to have that fear, but um, I think for from a specialty standpoint, this is one of the easiest to incorporate because you know the most investment you have to make is if you did buy an inventory. Uh, of, of fitting lenses, but unlike sports vision where you might have to buy fifty, eighty thousand dollars worth of equipment, um, this is a pretty good one. But but definitely worth it. Uh, overcome your fears. I want to thank you for your time. I'm sorry I ran over, but uh, these are my two little guys. They they keep me pretty busy in my free time. But hopefully we still have some people on board, and I'd be happy to stick around and answer some questions. Hey Jeff, thank you so much. You're um, welcome. And by the way, beautiful office. Thanks for showing that. That was an uh, uh, impressive facility. I've seen Dr. Nick. Uh, I, I know I'll butcher his last name, so I won't even try it, speak before. And he's great. He has a lot of energy. So um, if I would uh, recommend if anyone's really interested in, in ortho, okay, if you get a chance to see him uh, speak. What is his last name? Uh, Des Potitas. Yeah, I would. Everybody calls him Dr. D. Because you're not the first to uh, botch his last name. <laughs> I just passed. It. I didn't even botch it. I just I didn't even no. try it. <laughs> True. So a couple of questions here, Jeff. Uh, real quick. Um, how much chair time is this? And I, I'm going to assume that the chair time shrinks the longer you do it, the more you get proficient at it. But what is someone looking at if they started doing ortho K from the first one to let's say a month later, six months later? What are we looking at as far as chair time, number of follow-ups, um, and, and um, just till you get comfortable enough that the time commitment becomes uh, shrinks down enough to um, to make it more uh, efficient? Yeah. And, and, you know, that's kind of a hard question to answer because how much experience does the doctor have with RGPs? Um, if you're, you know, new to um, that element, you're going to spend more time because you're, you're not going to be as good at interpreting fluorescein patterns, that kind of thing. Um, but as Nick stated, in, 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 you know, the average case is going to run you four hours. Uh, you know, I would say you could probably add two hours to that in the beginning. So you probably spend a good six hours uh, with each case just because you're going to be rustier. But one of the reasons I like Wave is um, I take that topography, and once they say they want to do it, I don't have to have the patient come in and waste a whole bunch of time putting lenses in the patient's eye and then, oh, that doesn't fit, and then, you know, Oh, that doesn't fit. One of the reasons I like these custom systems is you're going to dramatically reduce your chair time, even if you're new. And and wave, and and I'm probably this eye space. I, I don't know because it's so new. Um, they have wonderful training so that you know you're going to know how to design an ortho K lens for most of your patients. The tricky stuff, yeah, that that you're going to, you know, that's going to take you a little more time and a little more training, but. But well, the reason I like these custom um, systems where you design it uh, on the computer is I don't have to waste any of that time. 
um, um, you know, fitting lenses, and 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 then yeah, well, I have to make changes. Yes, but they're usually fine tunings. It's it's not like when you're fitting trial lenses and oh god, that lens wasn't even close, you know. And then finally, three or four lenses later, you're where you want to be. Okay. And then lastly, Jeff, the for, again, for someone who's thinking about starting with, okay, they're inevitably going to have people in their chair who have never heard of things like myopia control or a big word like orthokeratology. So is this something that you, uh, in your experience, that they're quick to get on board with? Or is this something that they say, I need to do more research, and they come back a month later? Uh, and, and if how, how do you bring somebody up to speed? And understood, I know in your practice that you have um, a lot of word of mouth uh, referrals. So maybe to some degree, your practice is a little bit farther ahead on the word of mouth side and the people that are coming in that are pre-sold. But what about a, a practice that hasn't done this before and wants to get into it and wants to be able to effectively communicate that to the patient in the chair? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that question because... It got towards the end, and I, that's one of the more important things to, to getting conversions. Um, so first of all, you're going to get a real mix of responses. Um, you are going to get people that just sign up after a little, I mean, like you probably could talk about it for two minutes. And then you're going to get people, like I say, the engineering type people that are going to want to thoroughly research it. But... Um, so there really is a mix. I will tell you that, you know, with the majority of my patients still, after doing this almost a decade, with the majority of the patients, I'm still the first person bringing it up. But the difference is what's so cool and what allows you to really convert is I mention it to parents. I didn't, this was in my slide, but I didn't get a chance to mention it. Planting the seed is probably the most important thing that you can do. Because, with uh, especially with a myopic parent who's a minus 10, and I'll say, you know what, Mrs. Jones, Johnny is Plano this year. I mean, I don't say Plano, but Johnny does not need glasses this year. But you're very nearsighted, and I want to let you know that in the United States, and honestly all across the world, nearsightedness is getting much worse. In fact, there's been a 66% increase in the U.S., so there's a really good chance. I hope that Johnny's not going to get your nearsightedness, but if he does, here's the neat thing. And I'm going to give you this brochure. Um, there, we have some really cool tools that are going to keep your child from becoming as nearsighted as you have. And so, you know, so not even a candidate yet, but then three years from now, when now Johnny's a, a minus two, and they can see he's getting worse and worse, talk about a two-minute conversation. Um, so that's what I would say. If you're new to Ortho K and you're wanting to grow this, any chance you get, and here's another slam dunk. Um, if the parents had LASIK, you are really not wasting your time to mention Ortho K because that meant they were open to the latest and greatest for themselves. They know their kids can't have LASIK, but they want the latest and greatest for their kids. And so if a parent has LASIK, bing, that should be a clue. Plant the seed, even if the kid doesn't need glasses yet. Um, and there was another um, instance. But, but yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, um, you're, you're just going to have a real mix of patients' uh, demands. And I, I, I wish there was a simple way to say if you do it this way every time, it's going to work. But... I really read my patients, and there are some, I mean, why waste a 30 minutes on a conversation with a patient that's ready to do it after five? I don't do that. Um, but there are some patients where, you know, it takes more time. And that brings up another practice management problem, and that is you, you run the potential of getting very behind in your schedule if you get an engineering-type parent who has many, many questions. <laughs> so what I recommend is tell that parent, you know what, after you get maybe 10 minutes into it, you can tell this is not going to be a five-minute conversion. Um, you know what, I can tell you have a lot of questions. I'm running a little behind today, but I really want to answer your questions. So 
can we go up to the front desk and set you up for a consultation where we can talk more about this? So that's just another neat little pearl that I've learned after, you know, because it's very exciting. And when you've got someone who's very interested in this high fee um, uh, procedure, you really want to get a yes, um, but you end up potentially making all of your other patients unhappy because then you're 30 minutes behind for the rest of the day. So I don't know. Did that answer your question? It did, Jeff. And also, Jeff, I know you're uh, you're still in your office, so go home and tuck your <laughs> in. Okay. Uh, we'll call it a night. That was awesome, though. I really appreciate you doing this. I think this is the first one we've done with the member. Maybe not. But um, I think this was very helpful, and um, I, I really appreciate you hanging out a little bit with us tonight. Oh, you bet. So. You bet. You know I, I like talking about ortho <laughs> Yeah. Well, you prove that. All right. Um, yeah, I'm going to walk out here. But thanks a lot, buddy. You have a good night. Okay. All right, thanks everyone. Yep, bye-bye.